This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. Zero complaints, licensed and bonded. For physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality. Pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin. Satisfaction guaranteed. For fastest service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're delighted to have this returning guest. Dr. Jane Nielsen, MD, is not only a retired family practice and ER doc and drug testing specialist with over 13 years of running drug studies for the FDA. He's also a preparedness expert because he spent a decade and a half developing a preparedness retreat and community mission in the country of, island country of Haiti. And he's here to talk to us in detail about the lessons learned along the way of developing that retreat, as well as to open an opportunity for those of us in the preparedness community who may be considering a place that they want to consider as a preparedness retreat and even taking a leadership role in that regards. Dr. Nielsen, thanks for joining us again here on Liberty and Finance. It's good to be here. It's good to be here. When we first met in your office, you talked to me about, and you could see all around your office these uh, things that you had for sale from your Christian mission in Haiti mm-hmm. to help support the, the mission there. But much beyond that, as soon as we connected on the level of preparedness, uh, we've been together uh, pro- publishing videos ever since on many different topics, many of them related to preparedness. Could you give us a more detailed walkthrough of the lessons that you learned over the last decade and a half of shipping dozens of containers of goods and developing and community relationships and establishing all kinds of off-grid amenities and security and so on in your island getaway. I would love to. Uh, Fasten your seatbelt. We're going to move pretty fast on the slides because there are a lot of them. We will come back to that invitation in the end, and I'll talk about it when I get done. This is the end of 86 trips and 14 40-foot high cube shipping containers. I have 28 containers on the ground. I find them to be wonderful, wonderful uh, retreat prepper material because they are so durable and so safe. And um, I'll return to that idea later. This is the front entrance to my compound, and you'll get better pictures of it as we go along. This is my wife and I in 2004. We now look very old. Um, And at the end, I'll have my email again as as a way to get hold of me. Um, We are looking for a succession plan Um, because of our age and the fact that this mission is going to go on forever. We're looking for couples or families who are Christian and would be open to doing both Christian ministry work and uh, retreat work. Um, And we're centering that uh, around our entire farm school and agriculture, and I'll take you on a quick tour. We are in the south spur of Haiti. Haiti is a sea, and we're at the south shore of the south spur. And if you notice, the entire island is mountainous except where my compound is. This is a huge geoclastic release of soil from the mountains prehistorically that has given us 100 feet of topsoil. Um, and it is uh, very dry. The community is called the Savanet. We have lots of rock. Those are the kids going home after school. Uh, you look at that and go, boy, that's a wide road. That's not the road. That's the soil. Um, and here is Google Earth. On uh, the left of your screen, you can see the layout of my compound with gardens behind with French drains, farms in front, surgery in the middle, school across the road, and back to the right, agroforestry and my future fruit farm. That is all of my land. Land in Haiti cannot be owned by Americans. It is owned by my Haitian mission that I'm in charge of. And there's a real good reason for that. And it's turned out to protect us very well. The government does a good job of protecting us. This is a very quick video from the only time I got my drone to fly. And after that, I couldn't get it to fly. And you can see all the containers have roofs. 
rolled steel, very cheap. So I go up, you can see surgery up there at the front of the property, just on the edge of the video. Here's where I run into my digital wall and I tried to ram it again before I realized what was going on. You can see my fencing. I put a lot of work into figuring and over here to the left, you can see my dormitories and then North Compound and then the conference center and back home. This is Fan Fan. He's my island coordinator and does all of my work. He's a young man, but he is very sharp. And Shreban, my oldest and best friend, and Angelo and Philippe are my utility guys, and they've built everything you see. And over the years, I've developed quite a team of professionals. On top left is security, then my school administrator, then Fan Fan, then uh, uh, plumbing, Jan and I, Shreban, my friend, my carpenter, my wall builder, back on the bottom left, head of gardens, my welder, uh, Angelo, best friend and utility man, translator, utility man, Philippe, and Tutu, who is both a diesel mechanic and an electrician. Any one of those guys leaves me, got big problems. You all heard about the fact that the Haitians all moved to Brazil a few years ago, thinking they were going to find work. I lost lots of good people. This is my board back in the United States. Uh, we met by Zoom during COVID. And this is what I want to cover today. Land and soil, water, electricity, buildings, fences and gates, tools and workshops, streams, animal husbandry, medical services, disaster response, evangelism, misspelled, um, gardens, wells, guest house, feed program, conference center, wedding shop, storage, workshop, sewing center, surgery center, streams and tanks, and profit centers. So buckle your seatbelt. We started 20 years ago, and 16 years ago, we moved into the Sobnet, decided to quit working with other people, um, and I now have some profit centers going. We have about 4,000 people that we serve over about 25 square miles. We're the first mission in that community. It is a very dry community with an abundance of water underneath it if you know how to go get it. And as I said, we are at 137 feet of elevation, sandy soil. And in a mountainous area, we're a flat spot, and we're over the largest untapped aquifer in all of the Caribbean. And there is me up at the thumbtack in the middle of the Sabinet. I have six acres of land, 31 containers, 16,000 feet of PVC, five wells, 12 class school, a clinic, 150 solar panels. I'm taking in another 100 on the next container. 400 feet of universal fence, 8,000 square foot guest house, 5,600 square foot conference center, a radio station, and the rest of it we will cover as we go along. My soil analysis, 30% fit sand, 30% silt, 10% stone, not ideal. I'm working hard on soil amendment. Fortunately, I'm the highest point in the Savinette. I will not flood. Um, and I have a lot of land around me that I can lease much more cheaply than I can own. I'm not going to buy any more land. I have many, plenty of people who want to work with me. Here's one of them. The man on the right in the purple shirt, the man on the left my, is my good friend and translator, is one property away from me. We have one property between us, and I'm giving him a two-inch water line because he can't get water. And he's going to grow all of the forage for all of my animals. Nice trade. I have 40 acres of drip irrigation in my containers and there's one of my gardens. And you can see that in spite of my complaints about my soil, you can make it look nice. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers did a survey in 1974 of all of Haiti. And what we learned is that 95 feet down, I hit 16 feet of blue granite. And when I drill through that, I enter a non-rechargeable aquifer that is the largest in all of the Caribbean. And I'm down there where you see Monmouth Bonfred at the bottom left. This is how many roads, I'm not kidding, that were in Haiti in 1974. These were paved roads in 1974. It's not much better today, but our road now all goes all the way out to the tip. This report was invaluable to me. It told me where to drill, all kinds of things. And there's my first well done by IRD. And it was a happy day when that water came up and that today feeds a well in front of the school 
that constantly has people at it in spite of uh, stations up and down the road. When I talk about water uh, and working in the tropics, I always tell people you really need to know about Vitalite. This is greatly improved Gatorade with a lot less sugar and a lot more electrolytes. And you also need to know that coconut water in its raw form out of a coconut or a Goya's can is the best hydrating solution I have ever found. I can actually feel myself drinking it. It changes me instantly. It's an amazing product. This is our water control station. And you can see that those blue things are back check valves. If you have a well and you don't have back check valves, you can contaminate your well. And once it's contaminated, you can never fix it. I, this is designed so that I have 16,000 gallons of elevated water um, in tanks, and you'll see that soon. Never put anything in, but schedule 80 for water and always run the electrical line in conduit. And this is coming out of the room you just saw there, top right, the red room it is going across the street to the rest of the farm. I have 16,000 feet of two inch PVC serving the community. So this runs the entire length of my community. It goes to the back of my farm and it goes all the way to the back to the fruit farm. Plus, it goes north all the way up to the mountains. The people in the mountains lost their water a couple of years ago, and I ran uh, several thousand feet up to get them water in their community. On the last trip, I put two shipping containers on top of two other shipping containers in the front courtyard. And these are going to be lined with EPDM rubber, and each one will hold 8,000 gallons of water in the shade so you don't get uh, things growing in them um, and will allow me to take free electricity during the day and pump water up and then use kinetics at night to give me and the people in the community water at night. It's important as you watch, you can't tell when I'm being a missionary and when I'm being a prepper. And the reason is I don't believe there's any difference. My biggest single security as a prepper is that everyone who lives around me would take a bullet for me. Uh, they greatly appreciate Jan and I being there because we give them things that they themselves cannot acquire. And the more that I give them good, clean water that is distributed in front of their home and available to them for their gardens and letting them um, have their children be healthier, you can't give them a better gift. And the, now you can see one of the two containers has been roofed up there in the top left. The other one has yet to be cut. And eventually I'm gonna have a big 40 by 40 foot um, truck tarp canopy that goes across that. And that will turn that into an outer courtyard when I want it for having conferences. I have owned a lot of wells. I will never own anything but a Grunfos 25 SQF7. Uh, and the reason is that they run for about a decade with no maintenance and they run off of 110, 220, direct DC and they have a computer in them. And if you hook all power supplies up to them, they pick which one is most efficient to create the most water. Um, they, uh, those will fit in a four inch as well as a five inch case. Uh, I've never drilled a six inch case. Nobody does it in Haiti. Um, on the right is boreline hose. It's expensive. It's worth every penny of the investment. And the reason is it's flexible. If you put a 150 foot well down with PVC, when you pull the well back up, the PVC has to go 150 feet in the air, which it won't do, so it breaks off and you start all over again. With a bore line hose, I can use the hose to pull the well up, the well head. These things are indestructible, take incredible pressure, are highly durable, um, and they're available if you just search them on the web. They have excellent fittings. I own seven complete sets of these 200 feet deep. I put in nothing except US grade standard um, septic systems because I need to protect my water supply. So I have leach beds and septic tanks everywhere. Very uncommon in Haiti. Um, electricity and power. I'm going to skip this because I have it all in slides. That's my power room. There's two, two working on it. You can see my big Royal uh, batteries that can't give me power at night. There's my solar panels. These are first solar solar panels from Perrysburg. Um, 
And um, I have 150 left of 200 during the first earthquake in 2010. I gave some away to work with uh, Samaritan's Purse to get water on wells in areas that had no water for miles, and I never got them back. But it was a good investment. I also have solar panels mounted on the roof at the school. Those are the ones that run the water. I have three listers. If you have never studied about lister diesels, you need to spend some time on these. This is the most important power supply in the world for missionaries. Uh, the window bangers that run a high RPM um, and high compression last very little time. I've probably owned 10 gen generators in the last 15 years. None of them are running today. This thing is set 1100 RPMs, low pressure, single cylinder, 12 horsepower, the generator generates um, clean sine wave power. It is water cooled, which is why you see a tank up there. Mine's electric start. This is my other one. Watch the frame break loose. Once it gets going, watch the bottom. Yeah, John, he was pointing at it too. These things are wonderful. They're now out of India. Um, they're about $5,500. And what's important about them is on top of good quality power and stability and long life, they use about a gallon of diesel in eight hours to make 6,500 watts. Diesel in most third world countries is cheaper than gasoline, unlike America. I also have a 25,000 watt and a 30,000 watt Mitsubishi that one of them is to run my kitchen and one is to run air conditioning and surgery, but I found out I don't need the one in surgery. Very important thing, if you can find them, if you ever see a Fisher PayCal washing machine that's broken, grab it. It is the only washing machine that is made with a bottom rotor that's symmetrical in the bottom of the drum. You can take it apart, look up, how to snip the wires and rewire them to each other and, um, and then put it either on a water mill or a windmill. And this will generate about 2,400 watts in a 10 mile an hour wind. An amazing, amazing tool. I have two of them, plus I have another windmill. None of them installed yet because I just got my tower up. Buildings. You're going to see I love containers. They're impregnable. They're easy to lock. If you put an inch of PVC on the south wall and you put a second roof up to protect it, the containers maintain ambient temperature and you can work inside in them during the day. When you lay them out, think perimeters. When you step on my farm, you have to come through a gate at the road, then you have to come through a gate at my fence, then you have to come through a gate where between 15 and um, six, and then you still aren't in my compound because I have gates on both sides of the guest house in the north compound. I'm gated in the back corner. And as a result, I can work in my compound all day long and nobody can even see me. Meanwhile, these containers are nine and a half feet tall. They're on a foot and a half of stanchion with a wall around the base of them, which I'll show you next. Um, and so they're 11 feet tall. And then if you try and climb them, you run into the roof that's overhanging, the, the compound's impregnable. And all of the windows face in, no windows face out. There's my walls around the base. Gary makes great walls. Fences and security. I learned, took me a long time to learn how to make a concrete fence post. Wood doesn't last long at all and steel rusts very quickly. Uh, so I went with concrete fence post by taking quarter inch rebar and making those loops on a template with a bending machine. But I learned that you can't use river rock because it's round. You have to use standard broken gravel. And then they worked really, really well. I hauled in lots of gates, lots of farm gates. This is my back compound where my fish tanks are and where my French drain gardens are. There's my front gate. I can take these gates, flip one of them over weld them to each other and make an eight foot gate. I leave my rebar on the top of my walls because I can run concertina wire if I need to. I don't really need to. 
There's the gate at the school. You can combine the farm gate for a truck with a pedestrian gate, in this case, for the kids to get into school. And my son gave me, was going to tear this fence down. I went, oh my gosh, it's an incredibly nice fence. And he gave it to me, I hold it in. And I, I fenced the school and the school really appreciated it. They're glad to be able to control the kids. Tools and workshops. I have two 40 foot containers. Can we pause for a moment? Um, there was yep. other uh, questions that are asked after our last brief overview interview about security. People wondering about the need in the case of a stressful situation, if there's an upsetting time, that sort of thing, uh, additional tools. You talked to us in the past about um, basically low technology, well proven and very low cost um, defensive uh, tools that you're able to manufacture um, just am. from... If, if there's anything you feel comfortable sharing about that, that's fine. Oh, I, I certainly do. I, I managed on the last trip to finally purchase 12 gauge shotgun and a nine millimeter handgun. Uh, and I'm thrilled to have that. Um, but I don't really think that I need it, but I am in the mode and I've always been in the mode of wanting to be able to arm a troop of men if I felt it was necessary. And if you go up and you uh, type in, and I can send you the exact plans because I've already done this, uh, PVC archery bows. I sent in 200 arrows that I could, and you can buy them pretty cheaply in boxes of 100. I took in all kinds of those um, blades that you put in, in knives, in cu box cutters, and took a Metabo and epoxy and made my own broadheads. Uh, I wouldn't want to get shot with them because the blades are going to come off inside of you. I took in paracord and I took in a heat gun for taking wallpaper off, paint off. And I can make 42 pound test bows, but you have to be very careful. Not all PVC is good quality. I found out that Menards had the best PVC. I couldn't figure the brand out. What I did is I bought one inch PVC from everyone, and they teach you how to do a hammer test on it. And uh, I now have 25 bows with uh, 200 arrows with broadheads. Um, I they would be very intimidating. Um, but in the end, I still go back to your best security as friends with the people who surround you, um, and give things you know give people what they need. Um, this is one of my this is my tool shop. Not my workshop. This is my tool shop. I have an overhanging workshop I haven't finished yet. Um, we also, the conference center is a workshop for us. When we don't have conferences, we get stuff out and work on it. Uh, on the last trip, uh, Laura and I spent the whole trip uh, making the front compartment. And I'll come back to that. I have shipped more tools than that on every container I've ever taken. People, when men die, women are usually happy to give you all of his tools if you smile right. I have a lot of really nice tools. Streams, tanks, and ponds. Um, I don't believe in hiring a backhoe and paying Shell and some guy that's already got a lot of money to dig. One of the ways that I made a lot of friends with a lot of men is I've hired them for two weeks to dig for me. Everything that you see, I dug with a pick and a shovel. I ship in lots of bikes, and then I trade bikes for two weeks of labor, and it saved me a lot of money. Uh, if you are doing any surface stream work where you want to pump horizontally or do sump pump, you can't get a better pump than a Zeller, Z-O-E-L-L-E-R. They truly will last a lifetime. They look like a John Deere sitting on its back. They're incredible. Um, I'm working on permaculture, which means you don't line the streams. You let the water go out into your property. Um, and these were shot right after I dug them. So they, so we haven't gotten the, the rock off the ground yet. Um, and I have yet to prove that they'll hold water. Um, that is what happened when I had a big rainstorm, but a couple of days later, the water was gone. But if I put pigs, if I throw banana leaves and and uh, all kinds of leaves in and put cattle fence around the top so the pigs can't get out and raise a set of pigs in one of these streams, the biota of their droppings along with their walking on it uh, fills the streams up and, and makes them start sealing. 
I haven't proven that yet. These are my, my permaculture tanks. Technically, a permaculture tank shouldn't have cement sides, but if I didn't put a couple cement sides in my container, I would have had to get way far away from my containers. So the bottom and the right side are permaculture to allow the toxins out of the water. You can see lots and lots of piping. All of my tanks and my streams all run from one to the other. So all I need to do is go to the bottom of the stream and right beside Sharibin there on the ladder, one of those pipes is gonna fill this tank, which will then take me to the next tank. There's my uh, elevated water, elevated water. You can see my other tank further down. I have two 56,000 gallon tanks with a shallow end so that I can trap the fish. Another one, animal husbandry. All I do right now is raise 100, and, well, it's 160 rabbits as of this week in 100 cages. We had a lot of rabbits, but we uh, lost them in Hurricane Matthew, 190 miles an hour. Um, and we eventually plan to raise broiler chickens in layers. And I'll get into what I plan to do with all of that, along with fish eventually. If you're building cages, you need to remember that in the third world, cage wire needs to be one half by one inch. If you use what's called garden cloth, the rats can pull the babies down through the wire. And so everybody that I know who does rabbits in the third world uh, or baby chicks on wire says you've got to buy one half by one. That's a special order product. There's my rabbit cages. We could spend a long time here. If you look, you can see I forgot to put enough roof on. So they got too much sun and I had to throw a tarp up for a while. In the bottom, I took the fabric that you walk on in a greenhouse with the black with the yellow stripe, and I took a grommet machine and I paid women to sew them into boxes, and I'm hanging them on the back and the front underneath the cages, and all the droppings go in them. And then when I put my earthworms in there for composting, all I have to do is pull the bag out, not dig underneath that little space, and sieve it, and I get my worms, I get my topsoil, and I can reload my bags. I'm going to try raising birds underneath these containers. I think it may be too moldy, and I'll find out, but I've raised a lot of birds in my life in moldy environments, but never in Haiti. This is called a chicken tractor. It was invented by a man by the name of Brad Ward in Honduras, and what it does is it gives the animals a place to hide in the weather place to be outside and it lets one of your laborers walk up with a rope and drag it another 20 feet every three or four hours and the chicken droppings burn out the rough grass and make the pasture come back and it lets you have your birds fertilize your land and move them around easily while keeping them as layers or broilers. Um, very nice little technology, very, very easy to build, very affordable. It's all, you know, press fit stuff. PVC is great stuff in the third world. Um, medical services. Uh, not everybody's going to have the ability to do this. If you don't have a doc, you don't have medical services because the government isn't going to let you do anything. You could hire a nurse. Um, we have a nurse practitioner who sees patients for us, takes care of our students, and eventually will be the managers of our surgical center. Um, this, we've had this clinic open now for 13 years, and Marie France in the check shirt sees patients two days a week. And Amel in the back corner is her student who then went on full-time payroll with me. Uh, and she's working with Dr. Sue there, who is a missionary, comes down with us a couple times a year. We get all of our meds free from King and AmeriCares. I import about $8 million street value of meds a year into my clinic. I supply hospitals with stuff. I keep my clinic done. Um, being a missionary gets you a lot of stuff that's really valuable for free. Uh, that's Rich. That's my prepper partner. Uh, he, he and his wife have worked with us throughout the length of our, our, our work. And he's an optician. And he has a very sophisticated optical system called the Holland Kendall Optometric Program, which uh, gives you an inventory of glasses that are automatically cataloged in a computer. You can see the laptop behind them. Disaster response. If you work in the third world, there are gonna be times when you get hit by a disaster. 
And when you do, you stop what you're doing <coughs> and you help as many people as possible. In the first earthquake in 2010, I went into town and ran refugee centers, fed the prison and fed uh, refugees coming in from other cities. Uh, I made a lot of friends for life and, and um, I didn't do very much for my own community because they were unaffected other than the population of our community doubled for about a year because of how many refugees came into our end of the island. Um, and so that was our, our first disaster was the 2000 import of Prince earthquake. As everybody knows, that was a 150,000 death. Uh, we flew 75 airplanes a day in. I was the first person to break the air barrier against Hillary, who was trying to control the island. And once I did it, everybody realized they could fly into our little airport. And I ran the airport and, and distributed all of this food. It's a lot of fun. Uh, as a result of that, there was a big competition called Building Back Better, in which they asked people to develop earthquake recovery homes. And my best friend invented the light beam home, 300 pounds, $850. We won the competition in Port-au-Prince, and Bill Clinton took a kickback from a guy that wasn't even in a program, and they closed the program, and I never got to put any of these together. It's a really remarkable house. It's all made out of folded chloroplasts. It's about 40 seconds. Very inventive. He's got it all. He's now building them in South Africa. You could put this entire house on two donkeys and take it up a mountain. It'd take a Cat 5 um, hurricane and, and an earthquake. And an earthquake could just sit and shake. It's lined with EPDM on the floor. In 2016, we got hit with uh, 190 miles an hour for nine hours, slowest moving earth hurricane ever recorded on Earth, Hurricane Matthew, and it destroyed my community. It took off the roof of my school, my clinic, my kindergarten, but didn't affect any of my containers. It took four days for eight men with four chainsaws to clear the road seven miles from the road before we could even get back to the farm. One of my containers was not on stanchions and welded down and it flipped over on its head. It took me a week to get it flipped back over. What a pain. We went on to build 55 replacement homes and put 35 roofs on after Hurricane Matthew. The people in my community were slightly suspicious of me, wondered what my motives were, and most of them said, you never did anything for me. You can't help 4,000 people. Um, until I had a lottery. I didn't build houses for my friends. I had a lottery. And I made houses for the people who won the lottery. And after that, the attitude in the community changed very quickly. And these are all homes. The middle one on the right, you can see a woman nine months pregnant living under her roof. And when we went back on the next trip, she ran up to Jan and handed her her baby. Um, quite, quite an honor. Then August 14th of this year, we were hit by an 8.4 Richter earthquake. We were the epicenter, was nine miles away, and it destroyed all but 60 of 340 homes in the community. And here's a guy doing his job in a building I wouldn't have stepped into. I don't know who shot this picture. I wouldn't have gone in that building. This woman lost her house and is living on a tomb with her children. I don't know what that guy thinks he's doing, but he needs to pull that prop out and let that building fall down. We got 1,100 bags of cement, bought five block making machines, hired 16 guys to make block, hired 27 masons to go to work. And we, Jan and I went out and surveyed and counted for the first time all the homes in the community, 340 of them and gradated them in order of extremity of need. What's that? And there we go. And sometimes we put a wall in. That, that house on the top left, you can see we, we put the wall, the end wall back. Sometimes we just put corners on. Um, and on the bottom right, you can see a house that fell down and all 55 of the houses that I built in the hurricane didn't even have a crack in them after the earthquake. 
I, there's people are starting to pay attention to me when I teach them how to build evangelism. We are not church planners. We attend our local church. It's a, a Methodist church uh, or a Baptist church, and we're Methodist. Uh, I keep them in a sound system. I do a revival occasionally. I've got a Christian radio station. Uh, but mostly by being the hands and feet of Christ, we have been able to eliminate almost all of the voodoo in our community. We have people who are non-believers, but we don't have any active voodoo anymore. We offer English classes. Those are mostly taught by pastors. We participate in Operation Christmas Child. We run a summer-long Bible study. Um, and all of our teachers and most of our farm staff are Christian. That's my church. Full. There's my sound system I gave them. There's Samaritan's Purse. Great experience. Handing out um, boxes. People don't realize that when you make those boxes, the kids have to go to six weeks of Bible study, and they don't know when they go to the Bible study that they're going to get this present at the end. It's a very nice program. I have a 55-foot tower with a 300-watt radio station. It's been on the line on and off since March and is now working continuously. Uh, we have um, six DJs. Uh, we play Christian music, uh, do weather reports, which is very important in Haiti because nobody does weather. We do news that is balanced. And um, we provide public service announcements and we work with the USDA and people like that to, uh, during disasters. Um, and uh, we take advertising. And so I don't have any expense in this project. All of the DJs have to raise all their own advertising. Brad Reddick School. We have 300 kids in actually K through six and another 75 in seven through nine. And uh, we have a 100% pass rate, and the national average is about 70%. We were listed as one of the six best schools in the South uh, two years ago. We do school interface with local Ohio schools. We are going to have a full computer lab next year, um, and we're going to start doing technical schools, welding, aquaculture, and manufacturing. On top of our sewing school, this is what the school looked like when we built it, four rooms named after a dear friend of ours who died. And there it is with the fifth and sixth grade added in kindergarten on the right, that's 2010. And here's two years ago when we added seventh, eighth and ninth grade, which had a tremendous benefit of putting my solar panels higher in the air. We go to any school that has an auction and we buy all the chairs and all the tables. And it has saved us a lot of money. Those chairs were a dollar a piece and those tables were $2 a piece. This is my first graduating class 10 years ago. And we have uh, won an award of one of those great big playgrounds that they put in Metro Parks, and it's going down in the next container. Kids are kids all over the world. You can see the girls have got an attitude. And they love having fun. This is our upper class uniform. Um, these, that's our sign. It disappeared in Hurricane Matthew. These are our lower class uniforms. This is the kindergartners. A lot of fun. Kids are a lot of fun. There's our muffins. We make a muffin a day for every, everybody in uh, K through six. We don't feed the upper class kids. They know how to feed themselves. Feeding them, if you don't feed them, our pass rate would drop from 100% to about 60 uh, we teleconference with a local school system. And uh, when we were doing it at the farm, we would bring a few students over. That girl who's standing beside me wants to be an attorney, real sharp lady. And that school is doing chemistry and physics experiments and putting them on a thumb drive. And we're going to start using them to teach chemistry and physics in our classes. And I want to do that throughout Haiti. Oh, I'll let that go. Didn't know that was in there. This is my, few, you can see one of my listers back there at, at, the, um, at the back. And this is going to be my computer lab. It's gonna have 15, 24 inch monitors using Raspberry Pis. If you're not familiar with them, that's not a food, it's PI. It is a $35 computer Unix that is very stable and takes seven watts of power. These are my gardens, seed beds, gardens, gardens. Gardens, gardens, gardens in the back, agroforestry, 
really hurt in the hurricane, took everything down. Uh, we have 300 Moringa trees. Moringa is the most important tree in the world. It's called the miracle tree. A level teaspoon of the ground leaves contains more vitamins than a centrum vitamin. And it also, if you take the stems and press them and grind them and get the white sap out and dilute it a thousand to one and spray it on your vegetable plants, they grow 60% faster as a growth accelerant in it. Uh, Peter uh, planted 8,000 trees and gave them away after the hurricane to anybody who would plant them. And we reforested much of our, our part of the community. And there they were eight weeks later, going out, out the uh, door with our students and other people. Uh, breadfruit. Um, we just got a contract to grow breadfruit for another organization because we have drip irrigation. We have 21 species of bamboo with 86 holes dug. About 40 of them are filled. That bamboo is 10 years old and has never seen water. It's never been watered. When we finally put them on drip irrigation, they really grow a lot faster. This bamboo is only one year old. Uh, that's Franci, my head gardener, and he's starting to work on horticultural propagation because there's a lot of interest in town with people who would like to beautify their property. And we plan to be in that business. We have a number of choppers and tillers and a host of motors. Every electric motor you can take in is going to be able to have your welder turn it into something valuable eventually. This is, this is a wonderful company, Uncle Jim's Worm Farm. Uh, $65, 2,000 red composting worms. Composting worms don't go to the bottom of your pile. They come to the top. And so you can just keep throwing stuff in and they just turn it over. And of course, worms, nitrogen fix, just as do plants. And so you always want to be growing worms. Plus the worms are food for your rabbits. Or, or, I'm sorry, for your chickens and turkeys. I'm working at the University of Florida to bring butterflies back to Western Haiti. I'm still about five years away from the point where I'm ready to do that. I have to make rock gardens and then I have to grow plants and get them growing. And then after that, they're going to bring me butterflies. Anybody who is in um, the third world needs to take in a super and all the things to go in a super. You don't need to be managing equipment. Every community has an apiarist, but they don't have supers. And their supers are very low quality. And so I'm, I made sure I had all my beekeeping stuff because you need it for pollination. Guest house. This is our guest house where we live. Sorry about that. Didn't see that one coming. Um, we live underneath this porch. The porch is, uh, is keeping us out of the southwest sun. And so except for a brief period in the morning when this picture was taken, there's no sun on that table. We have business meetings, board meetings, bead meetings, supper, dinner, breakfast. Um, in there, over on the right, you can see my generator room. On the left, you can see my washing system for doing dishes. It's my front gate. There's Mishley, my security guard. Uh, everybody always liked my old security guard because he was a jerk. Uh, Mishley is nice to people. And people really love them. And I have no problems at the front gate anymore because people don't want to disappoint them. I think the big burly guys with a shotgun are maybe a mistake. That's the, my opening picture I showed you in the beginning. We have lots of containers have been turned into storage. This one is guest house storage and the place where I put all of my sound system for the conference. These are wonderful tools. If you don't know New Wave, they're a little bit power hungry, but during the day I have all the power I need. I would never run one of these off of batteries, but we can make a loaf of bread in each one of these every 22 minutes. And I feed a lot of my laborers with bread and butter, or bread and peanut butter, bread and jelly, bread and pepperoni. Um, don't get your refrigerators too big. Boy, they're power hogs, probably. Half of my power is going into my refrigerator and it's not very big. I do love ice though. Uh, this is a very nice way to, for us to cook. Uh, usually in Haiti, you'd be cooking over charcoal. Um, this is a nice system, but you're $220 a bottle. And so you really have to be frugal. Um, I'm lucky somebody gave me uh, this $13,000 solar oven. Uh, I'm probably gonna use it to make fish food. It actually isn't that useful. 
I can make bread in it, but it won't brown. <laughs> I can make roast and things like that. It's very hard to get much above 300 degrees, but it's a nice tool. It'll make a wonderful food dryer. Um, we live in shipping containers. We love them. No spiders, no bugs, no nets. Everyone, each one on both ends has a two by four casement window with a box fan. Um, they're indestructible. They've never moved in hurricanes. Uh, they give you lots of storage and halfway across uh, we pour, pour polyurethane on the floor, makes a very nice floor. Um, I didn't have a picture of our bathroom. We have a six by six foot bathroom, no, it's five by six foot bathroom with a 30 inch shower, a small sink and a toilet that serves both ends. Jan in 2009 um, taught 50 women and three men how to make jewelry. And we now are putting 30, now it's $40,000 a year in profits into the community by bringing this jewelry back to the United States and selling it at trade shows. It's a little bit of work for Jan and I, but we do love the fact that it, these women are earning a living. It's done a lot for their pride. It's done a lot for women's empowerment in our community. Um, and you can see some of the products, them concentrating. That's how we sell it to go to shows. They make a lot of interesting different products, ornaments. I have 9,000 feet, uh, 9,000 pounds of uh, Mercedes leather went up. I got another load. I'm looking for a leather worker who could teach me how to make good purses. Uh, conference center. There's the conference center before we got the roofs on it, et cetera. Um, and we have an elevated stage. I didn't know these things were going to be in there. I'm sorry about that. Um, and very large, no beams, high ceilings. Um, as I mentioned earlier, bikes are a wonderful tool that government calls a used bike worth $10. So they make me pay 25% duty, which is two fifty, And I get a hundred dollar value in labor in my last container. I'm taking in 300 bikes. The foyer to my conference centers, another container, surprise, surprise, computer lab on one end and a uh, uh, reception desk on the other end hasn't been installed yet. Another one of my partners, this is William Sania. He is the agronomist to the president of Haiti until he was assassinated. Uh, the president, not William. And William is going to start doing 10 conferences a year, week-long conferences on agriculture. He's the biggest teacher of agriculture in Haiti. He's going to use my facility. Um, this is his facility. Beautiful place, Jardim Botanique. Um, and he held conferences here out in the sun until he met me. Um, these are my bathrooms that I built. Uh, there's, uh, I have handicapped access everywhere. I don't think it's terribly important, but you know, no reason not to be. It's just a thing. There's 14 showers on the left, 16 toilets on the right, all made out of two by uh, four by eight foot sheets of half inch PVC and aluminum piping so that um, they can be pressure washed. And then I put shaving stations and toothbrushing stations outside. I haven't installed my mirrors yet. And there's my 106 bunk beds in the dormitories. And my next container will add 36 more beds. I'll be at 142 plus 40 beds in the guest house is 182 bed conference center. <coughs> Should be the largest conference center in Haiti. I bought out Donald Trump's hotel in downtown Toledo. And I bought duvets and all the sheets and all the towels and pillows for 146 beds. And then a church made me quilts. And um, I have a very nice bedding system for everybody. There's the Donald Trump run. I bought a 300 gallon diesel tank, pressure washed it, then sandblasted it. And I'm turning it in, put a, a gear reduction on it from an electric motor and I'm making a 300 gallon washing machine to do all my linen. This is my kitchen. I it's so long that I had to split it up and kick it on the screen. It's all triple phase. That's why I have that 30,000 watt generator. I've got four, two over under four convection ovens. I've got a brand new Hobart dishwasher and a four tray French fryer. Security lives on the north side, Shreben in the left, Michelin on the right. My wife has collected 130 dresses and now I'm up to about 80 suits. Um, and we have a wedding shop that rents dresses. The women 
rent their wedding dresses, and the men have a suit made that they have the rest of their life. It's much more logical than the way we do it in America. And we've held a number of weddings, and there's the uh, conference center transformed into a wedding center. There's the first wedding. It was Philippe and Joanne, my best friends down there. Storage, can't have enough shelves. This is the only damage we had in the earthquake. The earthquake knocked stuff off the shelves. This is my next project. I'm going to put a 20 foot by seven foot um, root cellar under one of the security containers. That's not my work. That's just a picture I grabbed. Root cellaring will let me store meds, root tubers, butter, wine, beer, all kinds of things that need to be at 55 degrees, free air conditioning. I will line mine and roof mine with PVC uh, foam insulation. Profit centers. If you're going to live down there, you got to make money. First thing we do is guest house services. We have teams that come in. We had uh, two stay with us for a couple of weeks uh, during the earthquake because they had no place to go. Um, and we provide guest house services with everything. We can make food for them or let them feed themselves, whatever they want to do. Jan just opened her sewing center on the last trip. And we have 48 women who are learning to sew. And after a year of them paying $3 a month to their instructor to teach them, and there's Luke, their instructor, we're going to start taking commercial contracts. We have antique pedal sewing machines and electric machines, and we have hundreds of bolts of fabric that were donated by a company in town when they couldn't sell them. We have a 20-foot storage room that's secure that we can put all the machines in. You can see the pedal machines underneath there. My surgery center. My surgery center actually isn't going to make much money doing surgery, but when American teams come in and bring in 30 people, nurses, doctors, et cetera, for two weeks to do surgery, we make a lot of money in the guest house services. And that's my sterilizer, my orthopedic surgical table, and a uh, anesthesia machine. Um, all of this was donated by my partner. His family lost a dear niece very early in her life, and they wanted to do something to memorialize her. And, uh, and this surgical center is their project. It has two surgery rooms. You can see one bottom left and one middle left uh, that are uh, 16 by 12 feet, big enough to do any kind of surgery. And then Rich has an optical center in the top right. I have a brief recovery area in the back and a laboratory and a sterilizer room. And if you couldn't get a picture of what it looks like, there it is made out of Luan. And that's the guy that whose family built the surgical center. It has two inches of polyurethane foam on the roof and is made out of four shipping containers. Therefore, I have no bugs, no dust, no sound. And this is being powered by a Lister, a 25,000 watt Mitsubishi and solar panels from the school. We ran the power from the school over so that we don't get duplicated systems. I have my C-arm from my practice. I did platelet-rich plasma injections. Um, that's down there waiting for me to do that service. There's Rich's 40,000 pair of glasses that we have. And that's where he's going to store. And this is my post-op recovery area. There will be uh, six beds on the north wall for coolness and then insulation on the south wall of both of these with a smaller bed above them. In Haiti, your post-op care is provided by your spouse or family member. So you have to have two beds for each patient. Um, and then if I get too far behind and they're like we're doing cataracts we can get a lot of patients very quickly then we may move people back and put them in the dormitory and this will all have a concrete floor and a roof and insulation and outside patio where people can sit in the sun it will have its own showers and toilets there's the septic system for surgery this is my main surgeon he is the best orthopedic surgeon in haiti this is my fluoroscope when I was in practice. And on the right is uh, spun blood ready to be drawn for platelet-rich plasma. You take six cc's of this blood out of a 220 cc specimen, spin it at 4,000 RPMs for 15 minutes in sodium citrate and inject it into a knee and uh, it will completely rebuild cartilage. 
On the left is all the things I can fix with platelet-rich plasma. I can do a patient for about four and a half dollars. Um, there's my fluoroscope. Surgery tables, fluoro tables, special lights, solar panels on the left. Got upper and lower endoscopy. I am working with an organization called Trimedics that is a nationwide biotech 501c3. And when I get my place up and ready to go, they will bring in a team on one time and test all of my equipment, find out what's broken and needs fixed from transport. And they will provide me with any of the equipment that I didn't manage to bring in. Those filing cabinets in the bottom are full of surgical tools. This is my shipping facility. Really, really nice facility because it comes with a forklift. And those are two different pictures. Don't get confused. Right and left are the opposite walls. You can see the air conditioning for surgery in this particular thing. Uh, I use uh, four by eight sheets of plywood to categorize things in advance. And then uh, when I'm done, the last thing that goes in the container is the plywood. There's bicycles going in. I'm standing on a box of solar panels. Books. I have 28 cases of textbooks. If anybody goes down there with a family, uh, they're going to be very pleased with the library. And here's, I happened to be there one time when we unloaded. And there you can see my four blocks of polyurethane foam that have gone in over the last two containers. These are all of my profit centers. Uh, the numbers are way off. Almost all of them are 100% done now. Return on investment, number of employees, income. That's income to the, to the mission, not income to the employees, and the benefit to MIA. So this is um, a new project. I have five Clorox manufacturing units. I can make 55 gallons of Clorox a day using nothing but 12 volt solar power. Um, and uh, then we put it in pop bottles, mark it with a Sharpie that is poisonous, and I'm giving a family, every 10 days, a five-gallon bucket with the faucet on it and a lid to take out and find their own pop bottles and sell it in the community. And most of my families will be able to make about $60 a month selling Clorox in Western Haiti. Those are the units. Very simple, really worth finding. I can tell you how to get those. Um, uh, the swim, swim for him is uh, actually brings it right up. This is a, I have everything there. I have the two 10 gallon milk containers and all of the copper to make a still. Uh, definitely as a prepper, I, I probably won't do that now, but if I got in a prepper environment, it'd probably be one of the first things I do for profit. All of these grizzly tools and Delta tools I have in my workshop, still wrapped in grease, I haven't opened them up because I'm not ready to have a wood workshop. I just use my standard power tools. I have two shopsmiths. I have a lot of really nice workshop tools. I have a nice welding shop. I have two of those $4,000 TIG welders, and I have three or four of the arc welders plus two wire welders. There's my FM radio station. Every prepper ought to own a, C a uh, shortwave radio. I have the contract to build these in Haiti. If I could come up with $100,000 free and clear, I would start immediately. I have people waiting for orders. But the front end load is a little, it's a little complicated, but I have the technology and the skills to do it now. It's the greatest vehicle in the world. It has a 10 horsepower diesel Yanmar engine, forward and reverse gear, does 19 miles an hour, gets 80 miles to the gallon and carries uh, 1,900 pounds. I've owned three of them. There's two of them. There's another one of them. We use them for everything. There's a mobile clinic that we're running off the battery. My last project, I found out in the um, earthquake, the second earthquake, that I have 50 to 60 families that are living in what I call the hot tin box. And it's just sticks and old useless roofing cobbled together. And as I have met more and more of these people, I asked my translator and good friend, uh, Maxon, I said, Maxon, where are the men? And he said, Dr. Nielsen, if they had a man, they wouldn't be living in these. No man would allow this. These are all widows or abandoned women with their children and sometimes a parent. And I went, so I'm doing all this work in this community and the 60 poorest families in the community, 
their house didn't blow down in hurricane and it didn't fall down in the earthquake. So I'm doing nothing for him. And he said, that's right. And I took a new look at my fruit farm, which I've done nothing with yet. And I decided that if I build 16 by 16 foot houses out of block and put them in groups of four, 32 by 32 feet, I can get my cost of a house down to $600 a unit, $2,400 a quadrangle. And I put in two leach beds with four showers and four toilets. And I put in a 32 by 32 foot summer kitchen with rocket stoves. And this is, I'm not sure if that back there, that's my land too. I know that this blue is my land. Uh, also, um, Jackson's is for sale. And I may think about getting that and using it for a project. Um, and so there's a rocket stove on the bottom left. It's designed incorrectly. No flame should be coming out of that thing. That should be horizontal. Both the feed chute and the air chute should be horizontal. Uh, but you can use sticks and cook very quickly. I'm going to put 2,000 gallon tank on top of all of the showers. And um, I should be able to move about 400 people onto my land. That's the story. Um, and let me go back. And I can put these women to work making the Clorox, running my seed production program, growing my vegetables, drying my vegetables, raising my goats, raising my chickens, and let them work off a little bit of rent on their property by working four or five days a week. Uh, free for me for their rent and the rest of it. I should be able to get them jobs that are paying. And because they're all living together, they should be able to do their own daycare and their own respite care for their elderly. Um, and interestingly, I told this story in my Bible study one night. And before I walked out of the room, it was all paid for. Whole thing, 70,000 bucks raised in the room that night. Everybody loved the project. If somebody moved in with me today, I would probably build something like this. It's a little different than what I want, but but pretty close. Um, I would build something like this, a personal home off the site where you could have some privacy, very affordable, very secure, very cool, very quiet, very nice way to make housing. A lot of people are doing it now. I've been doing it for a long time, but it's gotten very popular. Right now, you can't do it because shipping containers and in decent condition, we're $2,500, they're now 20,000. But when we get done with the backlog off the coast of California, they'll go back down. But now says the Wunsler, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Been my byline for mission work for a long time. Um, Let's go back and talk about object two. Um, I am looking for a couple or two or a family who are, are ready to bug out in the next couple of years and are willing to start in investing now by spending time down there helping me do what I'm doing. Um, and um, I need somebody who's going to be ready to take over. I have a, a steady uh, stream of income to support the mission. The mission's never really going to need money. My donors are very generous, and um, my own estate is eventually going to go into a trust for MIA. Um, and I have people back here that will run the mission. I need people on the ground. If you're interested and would like to spend some time with me, I'd like to do a Zoom call with you. Um, one person at a or one family at a time. Um, send me an email at j at wellnessrx.org down there in the bottom left. Don't email Jim. If go to the wrong place, that's my wife. Um, and um, I'm going to take applications. And let me stop sharing. Get back out to the front. Um, and uh, I'm hoping in the next year to to find some people who want to go down. Um, we're up and running and there's very little work to do. I am moving from building to making jobs. I believe that I can make about 300 jobs in the community when I get done. That would put somebody in every house in the community. 
We'll put that contact info in the description of this video as well so that anybody uh, who wants to reach out to you can. Folks, we've been here since 2013 talking to you about preparedness. People have talked about their own testimonies of steps that they've taken in their lives. This is a unique and significant opportunity for someone who's preparedness minded and mission minded. Uh, might be worth further exploring the potential of a good fit with uh, Dr. Nielsen to see if that's a good fit for your family's future. Any yep. uh, closing thoughts you had for us, Dr. Nielsen? No, I I, I think if I was ever going to, uh, if somebody said uh, in one sentence, tell me what um, um, what mistakes you've made, I would say, don't get over your skis. We never promise anything to anybody in Savannah. One day we say, oh, look, it's open. We never say someday we're going to do this. You disappoint a lot of people. You're much better off to bury your mistakes quietly at night, not publicly. A lot of things don't work out and they never knew what you were building. So they don't know what it was, you know, uh, and don't get over your skis is very, very important in Michigan. Before we go off the topic, people have asked several times in comments under your visits here, talking about your mission. Uh, they ask why Haiti uh, there's been lots of thoughts on that. I think you've talked to us about the climate being supportive of, you know, you're not going to freeze to death uh, you know, you, and that kind of thing. Uh, and it's uh, agricultural. The government, the government leaves me alone. They, have, they, they don't have enough government to bother me. They're about the only thing that ever happens to me with the government is on the last couple trips, the government has shown up from school, from health and from Ministry of Affairs, which runs about everything. Um, and the mayor came by and all they ever do is do, is there anything I can do to help you? Okay. Um, every once in a while, Ministry of Affairs will get an employee complaint and they come out to me and I go, I'm not dealing with that. You can tell me whatever you want, go to hell. I'm, I'm not going to do it. And they go, okay. And they walk away because they can't do for their own people what I'm doing for them. 70% of all of the services provided in Haiti are by missionaries. And so the missionaries there are simply adored. And that's the reason why I like being there as a prepper is, is because uh, everybody's furious about these kidnapped people right now. This is the first time they ever kidnapped missionaries. Oh, the people are, are terrified that if they kill one of those missionaries or anybody pays those kidnappers, we'll all quit going because it will be it'll be open season on us. And, uh, and so all the people understand that and they they all are, are just, and that's the reason nothing's happening. Nobody knows what to do. They're just slowly releasing these people because it's dangerous to threaten missionaries. Um, so I don't have a government problem. The people around me protect me. Um, I, I as, as you said, I don't have to worry. You know, people who bury themselves in a bunker in North Dakota don't have a growing season. I have a growing season 365 days a year. I have a lot of shade cloth in my containers. If I put shade cloth up, I can grow vegetables in July. Um, I, I have lots of revenue streams. It's easy to, well, it's not easy to get there right now because of the rebels. I have to fly a private plane out to the farm. I actually like it more because it's just easier day, a little bit more money. Um, but, um, you know, I can get there in one day. I'm not going far away. The only problem with being in Haiti is if the wheels come off, you've got to plan ahead. We know that the government likes to shut the airlines down when they want to control people. And so if you're not sure what's happening, I'm better off to be in Haiti and watch the news than be in the U.S. and watch the news. Yeah, that's one of the main concerns that's been expressed by viewers over the years is the assumption that there'd be a lot of danger because it's such a poor country that there could be a perception on the part of surrounding people that if times get even tougher, that go take from, you know, even though the golden goose is, is laying golden eggs, go get them all at once by just going and taking what you can. Well, the thoughts that you've I had towards that. I've never worked in Port-au-Prince because you can't have a perimeter, but I only have one road coming up from one highway and you have to pass through five miles of a community that all of my people are on both sides of the road, 50 feet back from the road. It's a gauntlet. If you came out and did something to me, all I'd have to do is go on the radio station and say, hey, everybody, stop everybody that's moving that you don't know because somebody just stole my whatever. They're trapped on my land. I have 25 square miles of land that that they consider to be my turf. OK, it's you, you, it's, you have so much more protection there than I have here. I don't need anybody protecting me here in the United States. I'm surrounded by protection there. 
So uh, would it work for everybody? No, but I think it works well for missionaries. Works very well for missionaries. If somebody went down there, had millions of bucks, and which is what I've spent, and and sat down and uh, built a compound and ignored the people around them, I don't know how that'd go. I think they'd probably just ignore each other. Um, one of the largest marijuana growers in Haiti is uh, about a mile north of me. Okay, every once in a while I see his truck full of marijuana go past, and they they always uh, make sure there are no police out. You know, police work with marijuana growers. Um, and um, they ignore everybody. And I understand they're real nasty dudes. Um, but the guy came down one day from there. He, he didn't know that I knew who he was. And he came down and asked me if he could borrow a power tool. And I said, sure. And he said, hey, I'm anything. Give me a call. You know, I, I find that everybody's trying to leave everybody alone there. They're too busy trying to stay alive to get too busy going a long way to cause a lot of problems in my experience. I don't get stuff stolen. Well, that's another point is that you and your wife have made numerous, numerous trips down there, but you're not down there all the time. In fact, you're not down there most of the time. So right. how does that work in your absence as, as a oh, you know, you're running this? Staff. Yeah, the staff run everything for me. I, I didn't go down for a year during COVID and we got uh, we finished all our projects while I was gone. I mean, it's a little harder because I'll make them give me a drawing of what I want and then they'll give it to me and I'll go, wait a second, what are you doing with this and that and this and that? And we may have to go back and forth three or four times. And sometimes when I get done, I'm a little disappointed because I wasn't there that I, I wasn't hands on that maybe something's a little off and it wasn't quite what I envisioned, but it works. You know, um, these guys are building it, not me. I don't know how to weld. I'm learning, but you know, they're, they're building it. They're running the chop saws. They're running the grinders. The other lesson I think that emerges from this is the the, the time frame. You were talking a, a decade and a half here. So people who think, well, they're just going to whip together their their getaway in, in one season or something and be ready for winter, that kind of thing. Um, you've you've been developing this over over the long haul. Any lessons that you learned about that? It's taken me it's taken me ten years to get stable solar. Uh, solar's tough. People who think solar's their answer, I go, you're up for it dark rude awakening in the middle of the night you're going to be sitting there in the dark and going man i don't own enough solar panels and then you find out in solar panels at all it's the batteries there are a million problems with solar the smallest short and everything goes dead you know i'm trying to switch over to wind power as much as i can it'll be more stable but i tell you i love that lister throw a gallon of diesel in there charge the batteries to the top and i'm golden fascinating and journey i'm sure it's <laughs> Well, well, true, true. Yeah. And any, well, that gets the importance of a plan B, plan C, et cetera, yep. diversity, all of the above rather deep. than one solution. It, it's very interesting food for thought. And for those who are truly interested in pursuing a potential of a fit for themselves and for their family, the contact info is in the description of this video. Once again, Dr. Nielsen, off grid doctor and preparedness uh, aficionado, we just thank you for joining us as always thank here you. again on Liberty and Thank you for the time. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. Zero complaints, licensed and bonded. For physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality. Pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin. Satisfaction guaranteed. For fastest service, Service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs.